and um, healthcare-based information. And I met Ram Raj at um, the Great 2014, and we've got a chat um, alongside Howard about some of the healthcare um, challenges of immigration. And um, Ram Raj often will come and share some of his ideas and um, some of the stuff that that was often been done. Ram Raj also has um, a little bit of history with the Biz Talk product team that I'll let him talk a little bit more about, so he's really one of the uh, experts in this healthcare space. Um, the, actually, I'll just get a couple of people know about background noise. Um, I guess um, I'll just check with um, Sriram and uh, anybody else's. Okay, I think we've cracked that now. Okay, so just to do a couple of shout outs before I hand over to Ram Raj then. So um, we got the Integrate Summit um, in a couple of weeks' time now. So hopefully everybody's seen the agenda which has come out for that summit and there's some pretty cool sessions in there. So again, if you like the content of Integration Monday and you can get yourself to London in April, it would be really great to see everybody. Um, the next thing's just about collaboration. So We've got um, we've got the Eventbrite stuff um, where people can see future events that we're going to have, um, and you can sign up and register to, to be kept in for those events. Um, the user group website has a link for anybody who wants to um, post any questions. So you can you can either put questions in the chat window um, here, or you can put questions on the website. The benefit of putting them on the website is that um, the, those questions will be there after the meeting, whereas the ones in the chat window won't be. So if you've got a question that um, Ram needs to go away and research, he can put a reply on, on the website. So that's the best place for questions. Um, otherwise, the next meeting is Sami who in Finland, who's going to be talking about um, EAI um, and multiple organizations followed by Tommaso, who's going to be talking about the ESB Toolkit. So we've got some pretty cool meetings lined up the next few weeks. At this point, I'm now going to hand over to, to Ram, who will tell us a bit more about healthcare integration. Thanks, Mike. Um Mike, are you able yeah, to hear me? Was the CNA playing then so on? So I asked Mike, Ram, I think I think you need to press that mute button again. Mark, yep, I'm going to mute everyone else. But are you able to hear me okay before I mute everyone else? Received. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Anything. So I need to understand if I still have to go there or not. That's crazy. <laughs> we get a really good yeah. commentary from Nino yeah. in the back. Because Ram, okay, you, I can work for. Can you just press for, that mute button uh, again? Nevada. And join me toolbar. Okay, because I still have to, to write the documentation. I have to. Com okay. Well, uh, th thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Ram Rajkumar. I'm from DappaSoft. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, healthcare interoperability today. So in a nutshell, uh, at a high level, you know, what I plan to go through today is very much just talk about my experiences in healthcare and sort of what I have sort of learned in my last uh, 10 plus years, give you a bit of background on, you know, some of the challenges that I've seen and some of the solutions that we have built, and also just give you a bit of a, a understanding around how the importance of interoperability within healthcare itself. So I'll just dive right into the deck. I probably have about 40, 45 minutes worth of content, so there'll be plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the, end of the presentation as well. So a uh, little bit about myself uh, before I get into the uh, presentation. As I mentioned, my name is Ram Rajkumar. I'm the uh, VP of Integration 
I'm the VP of Integration Services at Dapasoft. Uh, prior to working at Dapasoft, I actually used to work at Microsoft. Uh, more specifically, I used to be part of the BizTalk product team. And even more specifically, I was one of the members who worked on the on the HL7 Accelerator product. So, so I have a lot of deep understanding, I guess, even prior to joining Dapasoft with the whole HL7 stack, and obviously be able to leverage that information to, to be able to, to implement some solutions at Dapasoft. I've been sort of in the healthcare and tropability space for 10 plus years right now, so I'll, I'll give you a bit about my journey in the next few slides as I sort of uh, learned my way around healthcare integration so you get a sense of how uh, my, uh, my understanding and career has evolved in this space. Very quickly about the company. So this is the company I work for right now. As I mentioned, the company's name is Dapasoft. We are based out in Toronto, Canada. Um, there are about 100 plus people. Uh, I'm going to be talking primarily about integration today, but as a company, we do work in quite a bit of areas. Uh, we are a Microsoft Gold Certified Partner. We are proud to be the recipient of the My Integration Partner of the Year Award in 2013. In addition to integration, we do do work with uh, sort of the standard Microsoft technology stack, SQL, SharePoint, .NET, uh, BI tools and things like that. Uh, having said that, today the gist of my presentation is going to be all around integration. There's that box in the middle called Corolar, which is a product and solution that we have built on top of this talk on uh, around healthcare and interoperability. I'll talk a bit about that towards the end of the day, but uh, so as we get there, I'll sort of dive into that a little bit as well. So a bit of background on healthcare interoperability and uh, and sort of what that means. So. Ten, ten years ago, when I when I came into this world uh, at Dapasoft after leaving Microsoft, you know, and, and I used to have these meetings with uh, healthcare IT folks, right? So this would be anywhere from a CIO, director of IT, or an, or an applications manager in a hospital or a health system. And really, the number one question I think I used to get asked was, "Why do I need an integration engine?" Or some people called an ESB, some people called an interface engine in the healthcare world. And it was kind of interesting to me that I would go into these hospital meetings and you would think these are large organizations that this would be quite evident to them why uh, NESB is needed for their operations. But believe it or not, probably 10 years ago when I started, there was quite a few times I sort of get asked this question, why do I need an integration engine, ESB, interface engine? And after sort of a series of discussion, you know, majority of the time, the, you know, we reached the conclusion of why do I need it because I do something called HL7 version 2. Right, so HN7 version 2 is probably the most predominant standards that are used within hospitals today to integrate clinical systems. Right, so you know, after a series of discussion, you know, me asking a, lo a, long, a long list of questions around, hey, do you do this, do you do that? Really, about 10 years ago, the conclusion was always, we do a lot of HL7 v2 integration that's being done point to point with our vendors right now, but we might consider an integration engine if there's value in sort of reducing our dependency on vendors and point to point solutions. So for the folks who are not healthcare focused here, just my one slide on uh, what is HL7, right? So really doesn't matter if your standard is HL7 v2, v3, CDA, FHIR. The reality is HL7 is a standard that, is, uh, that was developed to transmit uh, healthcare information. Healthcare information could range and vary from anywhere from uh, just patient visits, patient administration information. So you walk into a hospital just to inform systems that, you know, you have a uh, uh, you have come into the hospital, you've been moved to a different location, collect all your allergy information, your order entries, so they need to do lab orders, pharmacy orders, imaging, to results, to scheduling, to even some financial uh, type information as well. So really, you know, regardless of the standard, when I you know, talk about HL7, B, B, B2, B3, really the type of clinical information that you're sharing between the systems are, are very similar. Now, the protocols that you use or the methodologies that you use might be slightly different, but the data is, uh, in all essence, it's pretty much the same. So, you know, again, I'm sort of looking at my view from my 10 years ago, right? So 10 years ago, we talked about integration with customers in health in the hospital, and they said we want to do HL7 v2. And then in the last 10 years, what are some of the integration scenarios that I've been sort of coming across uh, when I work with these healthcare institutions, right? So I sort of listed out a few over the next few slides. So the, uh, you know, if you're in healthcare, you've probably seen a diagram like this uh, quite a few times. You know, this is your typical, you know, uh, view of a hospital or a health system, right? We are, um, as I mentioned, I'm based out of Canada, so we are a single peer system. So for the folks from Europe, uh, very similar. You know, we have our healthcare system is very similar to I would say NHS. So a lot of my content is going to be focused on the clinical integration side and not on the payer side. 
right? So the peer side are uh, very popular in the U.S. as an example with HIPAA and everything else. Really, my focus today is going to be focused on the sort of the clinical type of integration and not necessarily on the peer side. So within a hospital, you know, you would have your you, you would have your uh, main hospital information system. You know, these could be your Epics or your Meditex, your Cerners, your McKesson, and you have a lot of line of business applications, right? So everywhere from your labs, your pharmacies, your, uh, your PACs, which is your DI and imaging, to food services, ambulatory, mental health systems. And what you would have is an ESB in the middle that is the broker between these various lines of systems and your major HIS, or even between these various lines of systems. You know, uh, and I go back to my story again 10 years ago when I sat with the hospital, this was the predominant use case that they were looking for an ESB, right? So they would want an ESB and you go through your list of integration requirements. This would be, you know, sort of the uh, one, if you know, one of the top three, if not something in most hospitals, the only one 10 years ago. So then, you know, at that point, you know, we were a Microsoft partner. We used to bring this talk in and talk to how we can leverage this talk in this, uh, you know, in this fashion. And here was one use case there where, you know, where you commonly see around healthcare integration. Another, you know, after a few years have gone by, you know, probably about the last five years ago, and this is very typical of what we see in Canada today, is the scope of integration within the health ecosystem sort of grew drastically, right, from integrating systems within the four walls of your hospital, which is like the small little orange boxes here, so the integration to the outside world uh, became a sort of a very, very predominant use case, right? So looking at, you know, external labs that you might connect to or centralized lab information systems, centralized diagnostic imaging, clinical data repositories, payers, uh, integration to physician office, to pharmacies, all of these became a core requirement when looking at what integration means to healthcare, right? So from, again, starting within the four walls of your uh, organization within the hospital to integrating to your partners became uh, not just a necessity, it actually became mandatory in some parts of the world. In Canada, for example, uh, we are a lot of uh, in, uh, implementations going across Canada today around sharing and consolidating of information centrally, you know, uh, at a jurisdictional level, at provincial level, even at a pan-Canadian level. I know in the U.S., uh, you know, the term HIE or the health information exchange is sort of the, is, you know, is sort of the happening thing now, right? Everyone wants to build an HIE, everyone wants to share data, and funding is being provided all the way from the government levels to other providers to be able to achieve these kind of vision. And really, this kind of an interoperability became a requirement so that patients can, or uh, patient data is easily accessible at every point of care, right? So as patients uh, go through their journey of healthcare, they're able to access this information so that providers have a holistic view of what the patient's health record is. So here's another sort of, you know, first inside the hospital, then external integration. So uh, about maybe uh, a few years ago, you know, we, come, we came across another scenario, right, that, uh, that what I'm coming into the healthcare more and more uh, popular, and again, very popular in Canada nowadays. So at the early stages, integration was within your four walls and your shirts, then you started sharing data. And now there are a lot of ESB integration scenarios around how do you expose the healthcare data to patients, right? So as a, if you look at a patient or even if you look at yourself, you know, the patient journey could lead anywhere from going to hospitals to labs to pharmacy, specialty care, home care. And how do you ensure that the patient have access to all their data, right, so that they can act at their fingertips, be able to bring their data, be able to share that with the physicians or the sort of care providers that they want to to be able to make informed healthcare decisions. So ESB started playing a very important role. Uh, ESB is, you know, started playing a great important role around how do you integrate clinical systems or, you know, uh, data and uh, data from care providers to patient portals. And Health Vault is a great offering from Microsoft that, uh, you know, an example of a patient portal is Health Vault. Microsoft came out with this offering a few years ago. Really a, a healthcare solution or a portal that is based, uh, you know, patient-centric. So it's not from the view of a provider and how a provider would want to access and use your data. It's more around how a patient gets to aggregate and share and use their data. So again, integration played an important role in how do you take the data that are stored in uh, clinical environments, such as hospitals and physician offices and labs, and how do you start exposing that data into a, into, into a patient portal so patients have access to their data. Finally, another you know, integration scenario that we see in hospitals nowadays, right? So 
you know, how, you know, this is what this is showing is sort of how integration is trying to become more and more vital and growing the scope and role of integration within health system. So now we have scenarios where integration is becoming a key enabler to BI strategies between uh, within healthcare uh, institutions. Right? As data is flowing through your ESB, it is really is one of the richest source of data within any health system because pretty much every data that's happening or every workflow within the hospital typically travels through an ESB for an integration purpose. Now more and more health systems are looking at this as a source of data that can feed a clinical data repository or a data warehousing so they can start doing BI and analytics on top of that data. So BI and analytics could, uh, you know, could scale anywhere from making real-time decision supports uh, to being able to do like KPIs around bed availability, wait times within ER, be able to do like infection control as an example. So as a patient has walked in, you have admitted up that patient, you have collected some information, as soon as the patient has uh, come in, based on the information they have provided, you're able to identify that this patient is for high risk of an infection. So that information can be piped into your a CDR, which where you can build your uh, real-time decision support and monitoring solutions on top of it, which can now give you, you know, much better access around how do you sort of uh, put a containment plan around this patient as they're walking through the floor, you know, as they're walking through your hospital. So again, you know, you can see how an ESB platform in a hospital has evolved from why do I need an ESB to Oh, I'm going to integrate stuff within my hospital or my health system. I'm going to be integrating to my external partners and entities. I'm going to be integrating to my patients to now integration has become a key enabler for BI scenarios. These are really examples that, you know, real-world scenarios that we do today and, you know, and we experience today as we sort of work with our customers. So this is just for, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, not to go in detail into this, right? So this is uh, the neck of the woods where I live, Ontario. That's where we live in Ontario, Canada, and Tr Toronto is within Ontario. This is our e-health blueprint, right? So this is what the, our, the, the province in Canada the, where I live in is looking to enable. You know, without sort of going into the, the meat of this diagram, really, you know, it's just evident looking at this time how many systems that we need to integrate with to have sort of that connected health system. As a single payer system, we are very focused on bringing connectivity between healthcare, all the healthcare systems in our province, right, so that we have access to all the data that we need at any point of service, right. But just to bring your focus to the middle box here that I'm sort of mousing over, which is the EHR services, you can see, you know, some of the layers that are called out sort of in our, in our blueprint. There's orchestration, con uh, consent enforcement, right? There is, uh, you know, business rules, audit logging, payload validation, pay, you know, payload security. Really, you can see sort of the principles of an ESB. So at the heart of our, e our EHR here in Canada, it's going to be powered by an ESB type technology, right? So how, you know, so you can kind of see, uh, you know, you can kind of see how, what a critical role integration plays in enabling our entire e-health blueprint, right? Less of it is sort of the what's surrounding it, sort of the e-health uh, assets and the ENO sort of point of, serve, point of care service providers, but really at the heart of it is being enabled by an ESP solution. So now, you know, uh, 10 years later, I walk into a hospital, I talk to some, uh, you know, CIO or a director of IT or an IT manager in a hospital, really the conversation has changed, right? So it has gone from... You know, do I need an integration engine? Do I need an ESB? To now the conversation really comes down to, does your ESB provide something like this, right? It's the, you know, it's sort of, it has become a de facto requirement now if you're running a, you know, a health system, you actually, you know, you need an integration engine to do one of, you know, a million things now, right? So I just put the slide together from, uh, from a very recent RFP that we responded to, right? So, these are all the requirements, healthcare-specific requirements that the RFP asked for for my hospital, right? So imagine being, uh, you know, 10 years ago, do you do HL7 V2 to, you know, it's expected that if your platform cannot provide CCDA, DICOM, RFID, P integration to personal health portal, HL7 V3, web services, you know, PIX PDQ, IHE, IHE profiles, uh, you know, terminology standards like LOINX, NOMAD, um, and protocols like XDS where we have to transfer data between uh, health systems. This has become the norm or the expectation now that if you cannot provide all of this stuff, really your platform cannot meet the requirements of a health system anymore. So you can see how much integration has grown sort of in the last 10 years, right? Starting from, uh, do I really need an ESB? To if you can't do all of this stuff, really your ESB might not meet the needs of my uh, healthcare institution's requirements. Right. So it's, it's very much as evolved and has been a, you know, a, you know, an immense learning experience uh, in terms of uh, understanding the space, but this is where we are today. 
asked, right? And why are they asking for all the supportability? Really, it comes back to the patient or the clients, right? How do you enable connective, uh, connectivity or around the continuum of care for a patient? So in, it would be sort of the overall nirvana of providing better care for patient at, at any point of service. Really, the, what interoperability plays is be able to give the access to the patient data to all the different type of care providers. And interoperability is sort of the heart of sort of enabling that ecosystem. All right. So healthcare interoperability challenges. Uh, so it's sort of now getting into a little bit more, uh, you know, around implementation of these solutions and, you know, what, what I have sort of learned in my last 10 years doing this stuff. Uh, a lot of these requirements might seem like, oh, pr pretty much, you know, which, which vertical or which industry doesn't need this stuff, right? Everyone needs uh, integration, and when it talks about integration, you know, many of these requirements may look like, oh, yeah, you know, finance needs this, insurance needs this, uh, you know, municipalities need it. But this is sort of, you know, what I have learned from healthcare. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of overlap between other industries. But first and foremost, uh, healthcare is a mission critical 24 by 7 environment, right? So. Pretty much if your ESB goes down within a health system, the impact uh, to patient care and the efficiency in how patient care is provided has a significant impact because there are, you know, as an example, as a, as a, in a, in a mid-sized health system, when a patient walks into a hospital, to the message that the patient has walked into the hospital, he has been admitted to the hospital, on average can be transmitted to 15 to 30 systems. So if an agreed pain property goes down, there are about 15 to 30 systems that does not have your updated patient record. Right, a simple ADT message uh, could not be sent. So really is you're looking at mission critical 24 by 7 environments. So whatever platform or the ESB platform that you choose needs to be able to provide uh, all the requirements that are needed to be able to support that 24 by 7 requirements. There are a lot of established and emerging standards, right? So uh, and as I mentioned 10 years ago when I had my discussion, everyone asked about HL7V2. Can you do HL7V2? And that was really all they talked about. Now there are a lot of new standards that are coming down the pipe because of uh, various requirements, right? Uh, you know, implementation requirements, legislative requirements, and so and some of them are emerging standards, right? I think uh, Howard last week did a presentation on fire. Uh, you know, that's one of the new emerging standards that's coming through in healthcare as new interoperability methodologies are you know sort of uh, are being introduced. Some new healthcare standards are being introduced as well to simplify interoperability. So really, as, as a healthcare implementer or as an integration implementer within the healthcare sector, how do you support uh, your established standards that are needed today, but also your platform is flexible enough to be able to implement some of the emerging standards that are coming down? Complex message formats, right? Uh, you know, I worked in the finance industry a little bit, so I have some experience with SWIFT and something else, other few things as well. But most HL7 standards are quite complex, and for the you know for the technical folks on the phone, really what that means is some of these schemas could be you know really really complex, right? There are certain message types in HL7 V3, as an example, requires like 15 schemas or 16 schemas to be able to conform to, to construct one message. So the the effort of getting some of these things is not uh, you know is, is not very straightforward for some of these implementation. Versioning, uh, you know, again, probably a very common problem across many verticals, but in uh, in the healthcare world, you know, as the standards are evolving, different versions are constantly released, and then you had to be able to support different different versions and different point in time. Actually, so different different versions at the same time based on the systems you're connecting to. There are a lot of legacy and modern protocols, right? So there are some legacy protocols like MLP, which is a TCP/IP uh, TCP/IP-based protocol to transfer messages to now. Uh, you know, everyone is looking at uh, web services, even looking at REST as a way to be able to do interoperability. So your, pro your, you know, your platform needs to be able to support both on the legacy end as well as on the modern set of protocols. Most healthcare interoperability uh, environments are quite complex, right? Uh, you know, and complex could mean different things to different verticals, but a typical environment that I would walk into a hospital, I would say would have about 100 plus interfaces, uh, and there are a lot of inter interdependencies, right? So one system sends the data, you need to publish it to 30 different systems. So you can have to architect for that, all these interdependencies between the system. Uh, you know, it's not unreal to see more than a million real-time transactions per day, right? You know, in, in a mid-sized hospital, you can walk in and you might see greater than one million real-time transactions. Now, these are not large transactions by any means. Healthcare implementations are very chatty, so it's very transactional-based. 
You know, patient walked into my hospital, trigger a message. Patient got admitted, trigger a message. Patient got transferred, trigger a message. So it's a very, very chatty environment. So your, your environment needs to be able to support these kind of workloads. Order delivery, you know, uh, it is probably one of the most important requirements in healthcare. So whatever platform that you are proposing needs to be able to fully support end-to-end -end order delivery messaging. If not, there will be uh, serious implications within the healthcare setting. Uh, some non-functional requirements. Again, I wouldn't say this is very unique to healthcare, but I thought it's, uh, it warrants sort of calling it out. Some of them might be unique to healthcare. Obviously, when you're talking about healthcare, you're looking at personal health record information, so privacy and security is a key factor to any platform that they choose that you can have all the privacy and security considerations can be met by your, pro may, uh, can be met by your solution. Audit requirements, being able to audit every little thing that goes through your environment because of many, 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 many regulations, you got to have sort of the utmost, uh, you know, pretty much be able to audit everything. Uh, high availability disaster recovery goes without saying. I talked about the 24-7 mission critical nature of this environment. Low latency, uh, you know, I talked about the 1 million messages per day, you know, being uh, for a typical environment, right? So, and most of these transactions are delivered in real time. Right, so when you're talking about delivering transactions in real time, uh, you know, you're really looking at a very, very low latency information. And some of these information has to be delivered in real time simply because the, the information has to be transferred between the systems in real time. Ability to handle operational downtimes. Uh, you know, this is something that's very, you know, sometimes I, it's very unique, I think, in healthcare, right? So because of the number of systems that you're connecting to, anywhere through 30 to 40 to 50 systems across 100, 100, 100 plus interfaces, it's very common in healthcare that certain systems may go down for uh, you know, service upgrades, so your cardiology system might be brought down over a weekend for a, for, for a service upgrade, or numerous systems could be brought down for different kinds of upgrades, or just out of operational failure. So there is an absolute requirement to be able to do store and forward or queue the transactions within your ESB solution until those systems come back up. Again, goes back to that order delivery. So you can't lose transactions or ignore the transactions that came to remote downtime. So really, you have to build your solution to be able to queue. You know, uh, you know, most customers would say, "Hey, can I queue up to a million transactions?" Because that will give me the robust uh, operational downtime requirements for some of my clinical systems. Uh, archiving becomes another key uh, requirement, right? It's not, uh, you know, it's pretty common for most people to ask for three to six months worth of real-time archive data that they can go through for historical audit purposes or method research, uh, you know, search, resubmission kind of requirements. So being able to have a very robust archiving mechanism to enable things like message search, edit, resubmit, again, very typical and common use case within healthcare. Just to uh, touch on a couple of functional requirements, right? You know, we take it for granted that everything that an ESB provides is a functional requirement, but very specific to healthcare. Uh, terminology services is huge. Um, healthcare is made up of many, many, many uh, uh, you know, many, 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 many uh, uh, standards like LOINC and uh, you know, SNOMED and things like that. You know, so things like that, uh, you know, being able to provide some sort of capability out of the, out of the box is very, very helpful. Real-time deployments, again, being able to deploy solutions without downtime is another key requirement as well. And then, and then obviously, infrastructure and uh, interface level monitoring. Last but not least, extensibility. Hello. Hi. Oh. Last but not least is extensibility, right? Being able to extend my platform to be able to support uh, you know, other future requirements that may be coming down the pipe uh, within healthcare. So, now, jumping very quickly to it, uh, what are healthcare customers looking for, right? So, it really comes down to they want a technology. Hey, Ram, Ram, it's just Mike. Um, we've got a bit of feedback on the um, chat that a few people were saying. So we've got a bit of feedback on the chat that the, um, the few people yeah, are finding it difficult to keep on with you because you're going too quickly. Sorry, Mike. Mike? Sorry, mate. Mike. I'm sorry, I, I just put it in there, Ram, because we've got a few people on the um, chat that was saying that you're rushing through the slides a little bit too quickly. And um, I, I, I tried to send you a message on Skype just to let you know, but I, I think it, it's quite difficult to follow. So I'm just going in to see if you can slow down a little bit. No, no worries. Thanks. No problem. I'll, no I'll worries, Mike. The presenter now. Okay. Thank you. Cheers.
Uh, Ram, you need to uh, mute everybody else in the uh, conference, so uh, can you please do that? Sorry, uh, well, th thanks for the feedback, guys. Sorry, I wasn't following seeing the, seeing the chat window, so I will try to go a little slower and also uh, make sure that I cover all the points in detail. So, healthcare customers, you know, what are they sort of looking for, right? So, they're looking for a technology that has some pre-built healthcare functionality, so support for standards and protocols and business rules management and things like that. But more importantly, when they're choosing these platforms, they're looking for some proven best practices with the platform. So with the, the fundamental premise of get it right the first time. Healthcare implementations are very, very repeatable. So having some sort of templates that helps them, uh, you know, be able to take a solution, be able to cut and paste that, or be able to reuse that across various implementations, that's one of the things that they look for. Again, uh, and it drives to the next point around analyst and uh, around analyst versus developers, right? There's a there's a varying uh, sort of degree within healthcare around is integration a job that's done by an analyst or a developer, right? In some healthcare institutions, it's very, very developer-centric. So they'll have .NET developers, Java developers, and they will be able to, you know, be able to take on a platform and go through the implementation. Sometimes it's analyst. And when it comes to an analyst, they look for a lot of starter kits or out-of-the-box tools to help them jumpstart the implementation. And finally, around vendor and software stability, right? So it's integration is usually a five to 10 year in, a investment by, by a healthcare system. So making sure that they pick a vendor that's gonna be around and who's gonna be involved and dedicated in supporting their vertical is also a key requirement for them. Finally, I sort of package, it, package all this into what I call sort of the interface lifecycle management. Really, they're looking for a tool that enables the interface lifecycle management. So ESB and healthcare. Uh, there are two types of ESBs in the in the marketplace that uh, that I sort of run into in healthcare. There are niche healthcare integration vendors. These niche vendors tend to provide a lot of rich healthcare specific or HL7 specific capabilities, and these would be your uh, you know your Orions, your Inner Systems, your Iguanas, your Merth. But when you're looking sort of the broader use cases beyond just your core bread and butter HL7 integration, they're a little bit more difficult to support. And then where, you know, what I'm going to be talking about today, where this talk falls into is sort of the enterprise ESB, right? It's a very, very horizontal platform, very, 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 very powerful in terms of its capabilities and how, uh, you know, it can be used for very broad sort of scenarios, but not doesn't, perhaps might not go very detailed into verticals, right? It's, uh, it's more focused around the uh, sort of the breadth offering of what an ESB needs to offer, might not perhaps have the depth offering around a specific, a specific vertical itself. Uh, requires significant, you know, most of them might require some uh, significant architecture and development experience to make sure that you're implementing the solution correctly. So when I talk to hospitals around healthcare, you know, this talk has pretty much everything that they need, right? So if you look at what they're looking for, pretty much, uh, you know, you've, I throw the slide up and there is nothing that's missing in terms of the enterprise capabilities that, uh, that a hospital looks for. Uh, most folks here, I'm sure, are very, very uh, this talk savvy here, so I'm not going to go into every one of these features, but really is a robust messaging engine that lets you do uh, any types of integration and offers all the high availability that a hospital will look for in terms of uh, HA, DR, scalability, performance, and everything else. On top of that, you know, Microsoft has, uh, you know, the HL7 accelerator for this talk server. Right, so the HL7 Accelerator is a toolkit that was, uh, uh, that was built on top of this talk by Microsoft. It has comprehensive support for HL7 v2 messaging. So if you're looking to do an HL7 v2 implementation, uh, the HL7 Accelerator is really uh, the place to start on this talk. Right, it gives you some of the uh, it gives you some of the key capabilities around how you jumpstart the implementation. So it's a fantastic accelerator that's used very heavily by hospitals today when they're doing uh, sort of the majority of the HL7 v2 type interoperability solutions. So uh, I'm sure these are discussions, you know, everyone has, has with their customers around architectural decisions, uh, but when it comes to HL7, these are some of the key things that 
that uh, we have, you know, I have sort of run across with customers and looking at well, how do we architect and what are some of the key design principles that we sort of talk through with our customers when they're looking at implementation for healthcare. So first, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, BizTalk uh, is sort of the Swiss Army knife, right? There are many ways to do certain things. So we get asked questions like, uh, you know, we need to implement uh, very, very messaging-centric solutions, healthcare solutions. So orchestration versus messaging. And the reason why orchestration pops up all the time is because most of the order delivery messaging patterns for this talk, you know, talks about the five orchestrations and things like that. So because people are finding that as sort of a, a common this talk pattern, you know, that seems to be a pattern that people look to and start implementing HL7 solutions using orchestrations and workflows and things like that. But where, you know, some of the gotchas that happens is sort of the low latency and sort of the large message volume requirements. So if you're looking at, you know, building hundreds of interfaces with numerous orchestrations, there's an impact that you would sort of have to face with the order delivery messaging capabilities and the low latency requirements and the overall manageability of your solution. So one of the key considerations is when you're looking at HL7 low lightweight messaging type solution is can you implement your solution without looking uh, without orchestration would be a key uh, you know would be a key factor. Again, it might mean writing some custom code in a pipeline component or something else. But absolutely in terms of providing what you need in terms of the performance and the low latency requirements, you know, looking at how you can implement the solution with a pure messaging based approach is something you would want to discuss. Archiving, again, um, archiving has many purposes for a healthcare, right? One of the big purposes is message search, message resubmission, message edit, uh, message edit, message resubmission. Not just for failed transactions, there are even use cases for resubmitting messages that have already gone through the ESB solution, right? So, so again, because of these requirements, customers have started looking at various options, right? Can we use this talk tracking, the DTA database? Can we use BAM as an alternative? Or a lot of people have gone down the path of custom solutions, right? There are tools out there that people have built around how do you archive this talk solutions and uh, for, for, for archiving and re, you know, message edit, message resubmission purposes. Again, one of the key requirements is usually it's a 90 to 120 day data retention period in your real time database with approximately a million transactions a day. So being able to sizing and scaling that, does the BizTalk tracking database give me uh, what I need or do I need to go build something custom is a discussion you want to start looking at just given the size and scale of what the tracking requirements are for a particular solution like this. Monitoring is another interesting one. Again, there's the standard monitoring tools like SCOM that comes with this talk and there's some excellent third party tools that are out there as well. Uh, but you know, most of the monitoring tools are very focused on infrastructure level monitoring, right? And what I mean by that is your server, your memory, your BizTalk host instances, and things like that. But, uh, you know, healthcare, I'm sure, is, uh, is very common to other, product, other verticals as well. There's a real need for monitoring, uh, uh, you know, there's a real need for monitoring of solutions in the, uh, you know, at the, at the interface level, right? Being able to take the solution, and being able to you know, monitor one specific receive port or a send port or a queue size or a lack of messages. So being able to design your monitoring solutions to support something like that. Uh, queuing is another main one as well, right? Uh, you know, queuing is another requirement as well, right? You know, how do you start queuing messages? I talked about a million plus message queuing as a sort of a requirement for this talk, right? So do you use message box, service buzz, MSMQ, SQL? Can, these are just lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of, uh, you know, architectural decisions that you need to sort of address that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're designing and architecting your solution for best talk, right? How do you sort of achieve all these things? Because these are very hard to sort of change on the fly after you sort of, uh, you know, come out with the architecture for your platform. So, you know, without going through all of these stuff, really what the, what the ask is, you know, what I've come across to learn is that what customers typically ask for is that, is there some patterns, tools, proven best practices for supporting common, uh, you know, healthcare interoperability challenges, right? So that's really what it comes down to, right? So BizTalk has a great platform, it does all of these stuff, but how do I take that platform, wrap it in a way with, with a lot of patterns and tools and best practices so you can meet most of your common interoperability challenges with, uh, with a significantly less effort and be able to now replicate that solution and be able to grow that solution as your demands for uh, healthcare probably grows. Okay, so now I'm going to jump into sort of what we have done, right? Uh, again, you know, I, 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 know, I know people have already been talking about, you know, is this a sales pitch, is this a sales pitch uh, on, on the chat window? 
really think of it as what we have done is we have taken a lot of our learnings and knowledge and best practices from our integration experiences in healthcare, and we have wrapped that into a solution, right? When, we, when I started this about 10 years ago, the amount of work, I guess, to get up the BizTalk solution with the proper architecture that we want, right, it was, was a quite a bit of work. And as I started, you know, going from health system to health system to health system to try to implement these solutions, there's a ton of reusable architectural best practices and patterns that sort of came into play between these health systems. So what we really did was, in a nutshell, just take all those best practices, built it into a solution or a toolkit that helps us jumpstart our implementations, but also ensures that we're sort of implementing the solution with the right architecture in mind from day one. Again, everything we have built is on top of the stock server. There's nothing that we have built that's sort of magic. Everything can be, uh, everything can be built, uh, you know, all, all the way from, from, from scratch as well. But again, these are just patterns that we have built. So in a nutshell, what is Corolar? I don't want to you know, spend too much time on this stuff. Uh, there's three pieces to it. We have a set of tool sets. There is a set of tool sets uh, on top of BizTalk server uh, for an enabled healthcare specific integration. We have a set of database or clinical data repository that we have built on set of SQL server and we have built some adapters in BizTalk that will enable you to connect up to HealthWorld. So these are sort of the three main buckets that we have built around uh, BizTalk server to enable healthcare interoperability. High level, the feature sets uh, that we have built, again, all built on top of BizTalk server. If you look at what a, a uh, healthcare implementer goes through is around interface documentation, development and testing, interface monitoring, some common services, operational reports, data repositories, and health wallet adapter. So if you're looking at doing health wallet, healthcare type integration, and if any of these scenarios make sense to you, absolutely reach out to us. There are some certain practices and architectural best practices we can point you towards around these things. I'm going to skip through some of these slides to, to get into some case studies, right? So uh, you know, talking about uh, healthcare and case study, there are some published Microsoft ones. These are great reference case studies. There are some reference case studies uh, that are out there on the Microsoft.com uh, case studies website. I'll just talk through a couple of them here. Uh, one of them is Hamilton Health Sciences, right? Uh, they're a large uh, regional healthcare service provider here in Ontario. Uh, they went through a massive epic implementation recently, right? So they're regional healthcare providers, so they have the full breadth of integration requirements because they're, they're a health system that needs to provide services, but they're also a regional healthcare provider for about uh, six or seven of the health systems. So everything from HL7 V2 integration to regional integration requirements, supportability of emerging standards. So these guys use BizTalk today. So if your customers are looking for a standard reference implementation of a healthcare interoperability solution, Hamilton would be a perfect one to look at, and there's a Microsoft case study that's there. Uh, another one, uh, Markham Stovall Hospital. Again, these guys are a, a mid-sized regional health system. They have about 400K population that they serve. They just went through a Meditech 6 implementation. They are connected to numerous HIE initiatives in the province, so connecting up the line of provincial information systems. Provincial implementation systems, uh, or your, or some of the regional implementation systems, they have used this talk to be able to implement all those interoperability within the, you know, uh, from their hospital. And so they would be a, a great reference case study you can look up as well. Again, it's also published on the Microsoft case study website. What's next, right? So. So, so nowadays, you know, cloud is becoming a big theme. And now when I'm sort of talking to hospitals and sort of getting a sense of what they are, you know, what are some of the upcoming initiatives, right? So now the questions I get asked by, you know, management in the hospital is, why do I need to do integration in the cloud, right? So, you know, just like 10 years ago, it was around, why, do I, why did I need an ESB? Now the question is, hey, why do I need integration in the cloud? And if you are talking to hospitals about cloud, you know, these are sort of the questions I get asked all the time uh, today because, I, you know, we are in there sort of having these meetings and sort of feeling out the, sort of the appetite for cloud-based solutions by customers. Well, first, uh, the obvious one, security and privacy, right? So there is a change in sort of way uh, work gets done in the cloud, and there are always concerns around given the sensitivity of the data that's being uh, usually used within a healthcare interoperability solutions. There's a lot of questions around security and privacy around where is the data stored, how is the data processed, who have access to my data. So ton of, you'll get a ton of questions around that. And you know, to be honest with you today, I, I don't think many healthcare institutions are ready for cloud-based solutions, but it's, you know, we are having these conversations. 
uh, latency, you know, someone on the technical front is one of the things I, I get asked, right? So, so you're asking me to move my ESB to the cloud, but all my vendors are still running on-premise, right? So you know, why, what's my value in taking the data that's sitting on an on-premise server, taking it to the cloud, and then moving it back on-premise, especially when I need no low-latency real-time scenarios? And there is some validity to that question. Uh, with IT folks, control is another big thing, right? So they're used to, if my server goes down, uh, there's a mission-critical environment, I can go to my DR site, bring something up, or I can fail over my SQL server or my BizTalk server and bring something up. There is a bit of resistance and hesitance around, okay, now who do I call, what do I do if my servers are not working, right? And when, what's sort of the process and protocol that's going to be implemented by a hospital to support this kind of, uh, this kind of a move to the cloud. Knowledge and resource availability, this is another big one. So, you know, we want to do something in the cloud, but who can maintain it, who can support it, who has the development experience to be able to develop solutions? You know, you talk about microservices or, uh, you know, other cloud-based uh, things that we've been hearing. You know, what is the uptime, right? Healthcare is a very risk-averse type uh, environment, right? They do not like to be the first at anything, per se, when it comes to technology. They like it to be... Uh, you know, they like it to be that other verticals or other industries have tried it, it's proven, uh, for, and then, you know, they're sort of slow to adopt those technologies. So until there, there's a comfort factor that, uh, you know, people are using it and other verticals are using it and they're being successful and all the, you know, the mandates are being met, there is a risk of, you know, customers, uh, you know, not ready to move there because they just don't, there isn't the knowledge and the resource in the marketplace for a health system to manage something like this. Having said all this stuff, you know, there there is a, you know, there is a need to build these things, right? Because the industry is going this way means, you know, people are going to move to the cloud. It's not a matter of, as people say, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. So when you're looking at moving to the cloud, some of the things we have started doing already, uh, you know, is building some industry-specific toolkits and services for the cloud, right? So if you look at certain things you may want to ex uh, explore as, how do you support IIT profiles, being able to expose uh, services or microservices to support HL7 V2 or MLP adapter or V3, XDS, CCDA. Some of these things, you know, I think uh, Howard talked last week about him building a microservice to consume fire. So people are starting to build that, and that's really how we build the ecosystem around this stuff, right? To build these services up front so people can play with it, people can, you know, people can use it, and then be able to you know, eventually, when the market is ready for it, you know, so these components and solutions are available for in the use. Uh, one of the other use cases, you know, I'm very, very interested in, and I'm sort of exploring this in myself uh, by ourselves, is CDR in the cloud, right? Uh, you know, we're looking at big data and some of the BI tools that Microsoft is sort of bringing to the market, right? So you can look at how you can, uh, you know, take the CDR type solution, put it in the cloud, and the scenarios that it can expose in terms of being able to run some of these uh, big data and BI tools that are available. Uh, in a nutshell, my, uh, I put my contact details up there. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, if you need to reach out to me, if any of this is of interest to you, we'd love to hear from you and talk to you. Uh, this is all the content I had. I know we have about 10 more minutes. So I guess perhaps I'll just open it up for Q&A. Uh, I haven't been looking at the chat window, but I will uh, just start looking at that a little bit and answering some of the questions. Uh, so I'm also on the, on the live discussion website as well. So I see a mail from Mike. This would be great if you can uh, be a little bit more clear on what Qualar brings on top of this talk. So